This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. The Blind Owl I was pleased with my face. I inspired in myself a certain voluptuous satisfaction. As I looked into the mirror I said to myself, your pain is so profound that it has settled in the depths of your eyes, and, if you weep, the tears will come from the very depths of your eyes, or they will not come at all. Then I said, you are a fool. Why don't you put an end to yourself here and now? What are you waiting for? What have you to hope for now? Have you forgotten the bottle of wine in the closet? One gulp, and there's an end of everything. Fool. You are a fool. Here I am, talking to the air. The thoughts which came into my mind were unrelated to one another. I could hear my voice in my throat, but I could not grasp the meaning of the words. The sounds were mingled in my brain with other sounds. My fingers seemed bigger than normal, as always when the fever was on me. My eyelids felt heavy, my lips had grown thick. I turned round and saw my nurse standing in the doorway. I burst out laughing. My nurse's face was motionless. Her lusterless eyes were fixed on me, but they were empty of surprise, irritation, or sadness. Generally speaking, it is ordinary stupid conduct that makes one laugh, but this laughter of mine arose from a deeper cause. The vast stupidity that I saw before me was part of the general inability of mankind to unravel the central problems of existence, and that thing which for her was shrouded in impenetrable darkness was a gesture of death itself. She took the brazier and walked with deliberation out of the room. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. My hands were covered with white flecks. I leaned against the wall, pressing my head to the bricks, and began to feel better. After a little I murmured the words of a song which I had heard somewhere or other, Come, let us go and drink wine. Let us drink wine of the kingdom of Ray. If we do not drink now, when should we drink? When the crisis was coming upon me, I could always feel its approach in advance, and was filled with an extraordinary uneasiness and depression, as though a cord had been tied tightly around my heart. My mood was like the weather before the storm breaks. At such times the real world receded from me, and I lived in a radiant world incalculably remote from that of Earth. Then I was afraid of myself and of everyone else. I suppose this condition of mine was due to my illness, which had sapped my mental strength. The sight of the old Odzanan's man and the butcher through the window filled me with fear. There was something frightening in their gestures and in their faces. My nurse told me a frightful thing. She swore by all the prophets that she had seen the old Odzanan's man come to my wife's room during the night, and that from behind the door she had heard the bitch say to him, Take your scarf off. It does not bear thinking of. Two or three days ago when I shrieked out and my wife came and stood in the doorway, I saw, I saw with my own eyes, that her lips bore the imprint of the old man's dirty yellow, decayed teeth, between which he used to recite the Arabic verses of the Quran. And, now I came to think of it, why was it that this man had been hanging about outside our house ever since I had got married? Was he one of the bitch's lovers? I remember I went over that same day to where the old man was sitting beside his wares and asked him how much he wanted for his jar. He looked at me over the folds of the scarf that muffled his face. Two decayed teeth emerged from under the hair lip, and he burst into laughter. It was a grating, 
hollow laugh of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. He said, do you usually buy things without looking at them? This jar is not worth bothering about. Take it, young man. Hope it brings you luck. His voice had a peculiar tone as he said, not worth bothering about. Hope it brings you luck. I put my hand into my pocket and took out two dirhams and four peshais, medieval coins, corresponding roughly to the modern Kron and Abbasi respectively, which I laid on the corner of the canvas sheet. He burst into laughter again. It was a grating laugh of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. I could have sunk into the ground with shame. I covered my face with my hands and walked back to the house. From all the articles laid out before him came a rusty smell as of dirty discarded objects which life had rejected. Perhaps his aim was to show people the discarded things of life and to draw attention to them. After all, was he not old and discarded himself? All the articles in his collection were dead, dirty and unserviceable. But what a stubborn life was in them, and what significance there was in their forms. These dead objects left a far deeper imprint upon my mind than living people could ever have done. But Nanny had told me this story about him, and had passed it on, it on to everyone else. With a dirty beggar. My nurse told me that my wife's bed had become infested with lice, and she had gone to the baths. I wonder how her shadow looked on the steamy wall of the bathhouse. No doubt it was a voluptuous shadow with plenty of self-confidence. All things considered, my wife's taste in men did not offend me this time. The old Odzanan's man was not a commonplace, flat, insipid creature like the stud males that stupid randy women usually fall for. The old man with his ailments, with the rind of misfortune that encrusted him, and the misery that emanated from him, was, probably without realizing it himself, a kind of small-scale exhibition organized by God for the edification of mankind. As he sat there with his squalid collection of wares on the ground in front of him, he was a sample and a personification of the whole creation. Yes, I had seen on my wife's face the mark of the two dirty, decayed teeth between which he used to recite the Arabic verses of the Quran. This was the same wife who would not let me come near her, who scorned me, and whom I loved in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that she had never once allowed me to kiss her on the lips. The sun was setting. From somewhere came the high-pitched, plaintive sound of a kettle drum. It was a sound expressive of entreaty and supplication, which awoke in me all my ancestral superstitions and, with them, my fear of the dark. The crisis, the approach of which I had felt in advance, and which I was expecting from moment to moment, came upon me. My whole body was rilled with burning heat, and I felt that I was suffocating. I collapsed onto my bed and shut my eyes. It seemed to me in my feverish condition that everything had expanded, and had lost all distinctness of outline. The ceiling, instead of sinking, had risen. I felt oppressed by the weight of my clothes. For no reason I stood up and sat down again upon my bed, murmuring to myself, the thing has reached the limit. This is beyond endurance. Then I stopped abruptly. After a little I began again slowly and distinctly, in an ironical tone of voice, the thing has. I stopped, and added, I am a fool. I paid no attention to the meaning of the words I uttered. I was merely amusing myself with the vibration of my voice in the air. Perhaps I was talking to my shadow in order to dispel my loneliness. And then I saw an incredible thing. 
the door opened and the bitch came into the room. So then, she used to think of me at times, and in spite of everything I still had reason to feel grateful to her. She knew that I was still alive, that I was suffering, that I was slowly dying. In spite of everything I still had reason to feel grateful to her. I only wondered whether she knew that I was dying because of her. If she did know that I would die perfectly happy. At that moment, I was the happiest man on the face of the earth. Merely by coming into the room the bitch had driven away all my evil thoughts. Some sort of radiation emanated from her, from her movements, and brought me relief. On this occasion she was in better health than when I had last seen her. She was plump and comfortable looking. She had on a cloak of tuss material. Her eyebrows were plucked and were stained with indigo. She was wearing a beauty spot and her face was made up with rouge, ceruse and coal. In a word she was turned out to perfection. She appeared to be well pleased with life. She was unconsciously holding the index finger of her left hand to her lips. Was this the same graceful creature, was this the slim, ethereal girl who, in a black pleated dress, had played hide and seek with me on the bank of the Saran, the unconstrained, childlike, frail girl whose ankles, appearing from under her skirt, had so excited me? Until this moment, when I had looked at her I had not seen her as she really was. Now it was as though a veil had fallen from my eyes. For some reason the thought of the sheep hanging by the door of the butcher's shop occurred to me. She had become for me the equivalent of a lump of butcher's meat. Her old enchantment had gone. She had become a comfortable, solid woman with a head full of commonplace, practical ideas. A genuine woman. Woman. I realized with a fright that my wife was now a grown-up, while I had remained a child. I actually felt ashamed in her presence, under her gaze. This woman who yielded her body to everyone, but me while I consoled myself with fanciful memories of her childhood, when her face was simple and innocent, and wore a dreamy, fleeting expression. This woman whose face still bore the tooth marks of the old odds and ends man in the square. No, this was not the same person as I had known. She asked me in a sarcastic tone, How are you feeling? I replied, Aren't you perfectly free? Don't you do everything you feel like doing? What does my health matter to you? She left the room, slamming the door behind her. She did not turn to look at me. It seems as though I have forgotten how to talk to the people of this world, to living people. She, the woman who I had thought was devoid of all feelings, was offended at my behavior. Several times I thought of getting up and going to her to fall at her feet, weeping and asking her to forgive me. Yes, weeping, for I thought that if only I could weep I should find relief. Some time passed, whether it was to be measured in minutes, hours or centuries I do not know. I had become like a madman and I derived an exquisite pleasure from the pain I felt. It was a pleasure which transcended human experience, a pleasure which only I was capable of feeling and which the gods themselves, if they existed, could not have experienced to such a degree. At that moment I was conscious of my superiority. I felt my superiority to the men of the rabble, to nature, and to the gods. The, the gods, that product of human lusts. I had become a god. I was greater than God, and I felt within me the eternal, infinite flux she came back. So then she was not as cruel as I had thought. I rose, kissed the hem of her dress and fell at her feet, weeping and coughing. 
I rubbed my face against her leg and several times I called her by her real name. It seemed to me that the sound of her real name had a peculiar ring. And at the same time in my heart, in the bottom of my heart, I said, bitch, bitch. I kissed her legs, the skin tasted like the stub end of a cucumber, faintly acrid and bitter. I wept and wept. How much time passed, so I do not know. When I came to myself she had gone. It may be that the space of time in which I had experienced all the pleasures, the caresses, and the pain of which the nature of man is susceptible had not lasted more than a moment. I was alone, in the same posture as when I used to sit with my opium pipe beside the brazier, sitting by my smoky oil lamp like the old Odzanan's man behind his wares. I did not budge from my place, but sat watching the smoke of the lamp. Particles of soot from the flame settled on my hands and face like black snow. My nurse came in with my supper, a bowl of barley broth, and a plate of greasy chicken pilaf. She uttered a scream of terror, dropped the tray, and ran out of the room. It pleased me to think that I was able at any rate to frighten her. I rose to my feet, snuffed the lampwick, and stood in front of the mirror. I smeared the particles of soot over my face. How frightful was the face that I saw. I pulled down my lower eyelids, released them, tugged at the corners of my mouth, puffed out my cheeks, pulled the tip of my beard upwards and twisted it out to the sides and grimaced it myself. My face had a natural talent for comical and horrible expressions. I felt that they enabled me to see with my own eyes all the weird shapes, all the comical, horrible, unbelievable images which lurked in the recesses of my mind. They were all familiar to me, I felt them within me, and yet at the same time they struck me as comical. All of these grimacing faces existed inside me and formed part of me. Horrible, criminal, ludicrous masks which changed at a single movement of my fingertip. The old Quran reader, the butcher, my wife. I saw, saw all of them within me. They were reflected in me as in a mirror. The forms of all of them existed inside me, but none of them belonged to me. Were not the substance and the expressions of my face the result of a mysterious sequence of impulsions, of my ancestors' temptations, lusts and despairs? And I who was the custodian of the heritage, did I not, through some mad, ludicrous feeling, consider it my duty, whether I liked it or not, to preserve this stock of facial expressions? Probably my face would be released from this responsibility, and would assume its own natural expression only at the moment of my death. But even then would not the expressions which had been incised on my face by a sardonic resolve leave their traces behind, too deeply engraved to be effaced? At all events I now knew what possibilities existed within me. I appreciated my own capabilities. Suddenly I burst into laughter. It was a harsh, grating, horrible laugh which made the hairs on my body stand on end. For I did not recognize my own laughter. It seemed to come from someone other than me. I felt that it had often reverberated in the depths of my throat, and that I had heard it in the depths of my ears. Simultaneously I began to cough. A clot of bloody phlegm, a fragment of my inside, fell onto the mirror. I wiped it across the glass with my fingertip. I turned round and saw Nanny staring at me. She was horror-stricken. She was holding in her hand a bowl of barley broth which she had brought me, thinking that I might now be able to eat my supper. I covered my face with my hands and ran behind the curtain which hung across the entrance to the closet. Later, as I was falling asleep, 
I felt as though my head was clamped in a fiery ring. The sharp exciting perfume of sandalwood oil with which I had filled my lamp penetrated my nostrils. It contained within it the odor of my wife's legs, and I felt in my mouth the faintly bitter taste of the stub end of a cucumber. I ran my hand over my body and mentally com compared it. Thighs, calves, arms and the rest with my wife's. I could see again the line of her thigh and buttocks, could feel the warmth of her body. The illusion was far stronger than a mere mental picture, it had the force of a physical need. I wanted to feel her body close to mine. A single gesture, a single effort of the will would have been enough to dispel the voluptuous temptation. Then the fiery ring around my head grew so tight and so burning hot that I sank deep into a mysterious sea, peopled with terrifying shapes. It was still dark when I was awakened by the voices of a band of drunken policemen who were marching along the street, joking obscenely among themselves. Then they sang in chorus, Come, let us go and drink wine. Let us drink wine of the kingdom of Ray. If we do not drink now, when should we drink? I remembered. No, I had a sudden flash of inspiration. I had some wine in the closet, a bottle of wine which contained a portion of cobra venom. One gulp of that wine, and all the nightmares of life would fade as though they had never been. But what about the bitch? The word intensified my longing for her, brought her before me full of vitality and warmth. What better could I do than give her a glass of that wine and drink off another myself? Then we should die together in a single convulsion. What is love? For the rabble men it is an obscenity, a carnal, ephemeral thing. The rabble men must needs express their love in lascivious songs, in obscenities and in the foul phrases they are always repeating, drunk or sober. Shoving the donkey's hoof into the mud, giving the ground a thump, and so forth. Love for her meant something different to me. True, I had known her for many years. Her strange, slanting eyes, small, half-open mouth, husky, soft voice, all of these things were charged with distant, painful memories, and in all of them I sought something of which I had been deprived, something that was intimately connected with my being and which had been taken from me. Had I been deprived of this thing for all time to come? The fear that it might be so aroused in me a grimmer feeling. The thought of the other pleasure, the one which might compensate me for my hopeless love, had become a kind of obsession. For some reason the figure of the butcher opposite the window of my room occurred to me. I remembered how he would roll up his sleeves, utter the sacred formula Besmela, in the name of God. The formula pronounced by modems at the beginning of any important undertaking. And proceed to cut up his meat. His expression and attitude were always present to my mind. In the end I too came to a decision, a frightful decision. I got out of bed, rolled up my sleeves and took out the bone-handled knife which I had hidden underneath my pillow. I stooped and threw a yellow cloak over my shoulders and muffled my neck and face in a scarf. I felt that as I did so I assumed an attitude of mind which was a cross between that of the butcher and that of the old Odzanin's man. Then I went on tiptoe towards my wife's room. When I reached it I found that it was quite dark. I softly opened the door. She seemed to be dreaming. She cried, loudly and distinctly, take your scarf off. I went over to her bedside and bent down until I could feel her warm, even breath upon my face. What pleasant warmth and vitality there was in her breath. 
It seemed to me that if only I could breathe in this warmth for a while I should come to life again. I had thought for so long that other people's breath must be burning hot like mine. I looked around carefully to see if there was anyone else in the room, to make sure that none of her lovers was there. She was alone. I realized that all the things people said about her were mere slander. How did I know that she was not still a virgin? I was ashamed of all my unfair suspicions. This sensation lasted only a minute. Suddenly from outside the door came the sound of a sneeze and I heard a stifled mocking laugh, of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. The sound contracted every nerve in my body. If I had not heard the sneeze and the laugh, if the man, whoever he was, had not given me pause, a Persian superstition requires that, if anyone present should sneeze, any action which one may have been about to undertake be postponed. I should have carried out my decision and cut her body into pieces. I should have given the meat to the butcher opposite our house to sell to his customers, and, in fulfillment of a special resolution, I myself should have given a piece of the flesh of her thigh to the old Quran reader and gone to him on the following day and said, Do you know where that meat you ate last night came from? If he had not laughed, I should have done this. I should have had to do it in the dark, so that I should not have been compelled to meet the bitch's eye. Her expression of reproach would have been too much for me. Finally I snatched up a piece of cloth which was trailing from her bed, and in which my foot had caught, and fled from the room. I tossed the knife up onto the roof, because it was the knife that had suggested the idea of murder to me. I got rid of a knife which was identical with the one I had seen in the butcher's hand. When I got back to my room, I saw by the light of my oil lamp that the cloth I had taken with me was her nightdress, a soiled nightdress which had been in contact with her flesh, a soft, silk nightdress of Indian make. It smelt of her body and of champak perfume, and it still held something of the warmth of her body, something of her. I held it against my face and breathed deeply. Then I lay down, placed it between my legs and fell asleep. I had never slept as soundly as I did that night. Early in the morning I was awoken by my wife's clamors. She was lamenting the disappearance of her nightdress and kept repeating at the top of her voice, a brand new nightdress, despite the fact that it had a tear in the sleeve. I would not have given it back to her to save my life. Surely, I was entitled to keep an old nightdress of my own wife's. When Nanny brought me my ass's milk, honey and bread, I found that she had placed a bone-handled knife on the tray beside the breakfast things. She said she had noticed it among the old odds and ends man's wares and had bought it from him. Then she said, raising her eyebrows, let's hope it'll come in handy someday. I picked it up and examined it. It, it was my own knife. Then Nanny said in a querulous, offended tone, Oh yes, my daughter, she meant the bitch, was saying this morning that I stole her nightdress during the night. I don't want to have to answer for anything connected with you too. Anyway, she began to bleed yesterday. I knew it was the baby. According to her, she got pregnant at the baths. It was popularly believed that women could become pregnant through using the public baths, which were frequented, at different hours, by men also. The belief could be exploited to provide an explanation of otherwise inexplicable pregnancies. I went to her room to massage her belly during the night, and I noticed her arms were all black and blue. She showed them to me and said, I went down to the cellar at an unlucky time, and the good people gave me an awful pinching. She went on, did you know your wife's been pregnant for a long time? 
I laughed and said, I dare say the child looked like the old man that reads the Quran. I suppose it gave its first leap when she was looking at the old man's face. Another popular belief was that a baby would resemble the person at whom the mother happened to be looking when it stirred for the first time in the womb. Nanny looked at me indignantly and went out of the room. Apparently she had not expected such a reply. I rose hastily, picked up the bone-handled knife with a trembling hand, put it away in the box in the closet, and shut the lid. No, it was out of the question that the baby should have left when she was looking at my face. It must have been the old odds and ends man. Sometime during the afternoon the door of my room opened and her little brother, the bitch's little brother, came in, biting his nail. You could tell the moment you saw them that they were brother and sister. The resemblance was extraordinary. He had full, moist, sensual lips, languid, heavy eyelids, slanting, wondering eyes, high cheekbones, unruly, date-colored hair, and a complexion the color of ripe wheat. He was the image of the bitch, and he had a touch of her satanic spirit. His was one of those impassive, soulless Turkoman faces which are so appropriate to a people engaged in an unremitting battle with life, a people which regards any action as permissible if it helps it to go on living. Nature had shaped this brother and sister over many generations. Their ancestors had lived exposed to sun and rain, battling unceasingly with their environment, and had not only transmitted to them faces and characters modified correspondingly, but had bequeathed to them a share of their stubbornness, sensuality, rapacity and hungriness. I remembered the taste of his lips, faintly bitter, like that of the stub end of a cucumber. When he came into the room he looked at me with his wondering Turkoman eyes and said, Mummy says the doctor said you are going to die, and it'll be a good riddance for us. How do people die? I said, tell her I have been dead for a long time. Mummy said, if I hadn't had a miscarriage the whole house would have belonged to us. I involuntarily burst out laughing. It was a hollow, grating laugh, of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. I did not recognize the sound of my own voice. The child ran from the room in terror. I realized then why it was that the butcher found it pleasant to wipe the blade of his bone-handled knife on the legs of the sheep. The pleasure of cutting up the raw meat in which the dead, coagulated blood had settled, like slime on the bottom of a tank, while the watery liquid dripped from the windpipes onto the ground. The ye yellow dog outside the shop, the severed ox head on the floor, staring dimly, and the heads of the sheep themselves with the dust of death, on their eyes, they too had seen this, they too knew what the butcher felt. I understood now that I had become a miniature god. I had transcended the mean, paltry needs of mankind and felt within me the flux of eternity. What is eternity? To me eternity meant to play hide and seek with the bitch on the bank of the saran, to shut my eyes for a single moment and hide my face in the skirt of her dress. All at once I realized that I was talking to myself, and that, in a strange way, I was trying to talk to myself, but my lips had become so heavy that they were incapable of the least movement. Yet although my lips did not stir, and I could not hear my voice I felt that I was talking to myself. In this room which was steadily shrinking and growing dark like the grave, night had surrounded me with its fearful shadows. In the light of the smoky oil lamp, my shadow, in the sheepskin jacket, cloak and scarf that I was wearing, was stretched motionless across the wall. The shadow that I cast upon the wall was much denser and more distinct than my real body. 
My shadow had become more real than myself. The old Odzanin's man, the butcher, nanny and the bitch, my wife, were shadows of me, shadows in the midst of which I was imprisoned. I had become like a screech owl, but my cries caught in my throat, and I spat them out in the form of clots of blood. Perhaps screech owls are subject to a disease which makes them think as I think. My shadow on the wall had become exactly like an owl and, leaning forward, read intently every word I wrote. Without doubt he understood perfectly. Only he was capable of understanding. When I looked out of the corner of my eye at my shadow on the wall I felt afraid. It was a dark, silent night like the night which had enveloped all my being, a night peopled with fearful shapes which grimaced at me from door and wall and curtain. At times my room became so narrow that I felt that I was lying in a coffin. My temples were burning. My limbs were incapable of the least movement. A weight was pressing on my chest like the weight of the carcasses they sling over the backs of horses and deliver to the butchers. Death was murmuring his song in my ear like a stammering man who was obliged to repeat each word and who, when he has come to the end of a line, has to begin it afresh. His song penetrated my flesh like the whine of a saw. He would raise his voice and suddenly fall silent. My eyes were not yet closed when a band of drunken policemen marched by in the street outside my room, joking obscenely among themselves. Then they sang in chorus, Come, let us go and drink wine. Let us drink wine of the kingdom of Ray. If we do not drink now, when should we drink? I said to myself, since the police are going to get me in the end. Suddenly I felt within me a superhuman force. My forehead grew cool. I rose, threw a yellow cloak over my shoulders and wrapped my scarf two or three times around my neck. I bent down, went into the closet, and took out the bone-handled knife which I had hidden in the box. Then I went on tiptoe towards the bitch's room. When I reached the door I saw that the room was in complete darkness. I listened and heard her voice saying, Have you come? Take your scarf off. Her voice had a pleasant quality, as it had had in her childhood. It reminded me of the unconscious murmuring of someone who was dreaming. I myself had heard this voice in the past when I was in a deep sleep. Was she dreaming? Her voice was husky and thick. It had become like the voice of the little girl who had played hide and seek with me on the bank of the Saran. I stood motionless. Then I heard her say again, Come in. Take your scarf off. I walked softly into the dark room. I took off my cloak and scarf and the rest of my clothes and crept into her bed. For some reason I kept the bone-handled knife in my hand. It seemed to me that the warmth of her bed infused a new life into me. I remembered the pale, thin little girl with the big, strange Turkoman eyes with whom I had played hide-and-seek on the bank of the Saran, and I clasped her pleasant, moist, warm body in my arms. Clasped her? No, I sprang upon her like a savage, hungry beast, and in the bottom of my heart I loathed her. To me love and hatred were twins. Her fresh, moonlight pale body, my wife's body, opened and enclosed me within itself like a cobra coiling around its prey. The perfume of her bosom made my head swim, the flesh of the arm which encircled my neck was soft and warm. I wished that my life could cease at that moment, for the hatred, the rancor that I felt for her had vanished, and I tried to hold back my tears. Her legs somehow locked behind mine like those of a mandrake and her arms held me firmly by the neck. I felt the pleasant warmth of, of that young flesh. 
Every atom in my burning body drank in that warmth. I felt that I was her prey and she was drawing me into herself. I was filled with mingled terror and delight. Her mouth was bitter to the taste, like the stub end of a cucumber. Under the pleasant pressure of her embrace, I streamed with sweat. I was beside myself with passion. I was dominated by my body, by each atom of my material being, and they shouted aloud their song of victory. Doomed, helpless in this boundless sea, I bowed my head in surrender before the stormy passion of the waves. Her hair, redolent of champak, clung about my face, and a cry of anguish and joy burst forth from the depths of our beings. Suddenly I felt that she was biting my lips savagely, so savagely that she bit it through. Used she to bite her nail in this way, or had she realized that I was not the hair-lipped old man? I tried to break free from her, but was unable to make the slightest movement. My efforts were useless. The flesh of our bodies had been soldered into one. I thought to myself that she had gone mad. As we struggled, I involuntarily jerked my hand. I felt the knife, which I was still holding, sink somewhere into her flesh. A warm liquid spurted into my face. She uttered a shriek and released me. Keeping my fist clenched on the warm liquid in my hand, I tossed the knife away. I ran my other hand over her body. It was utterly cold. She was dead. And then I burst into a fit of coughing. But no, it was not coughing. It was a hollow grating laugh, of a quality to make the hairs on one's body stand on end. In terror, I threw my cloak over my shoulders and hurried back to my own room. I opened my hand in the light of the oil lamp, in the palm of my hand lay her eye, and I was drenched in blood. I went over and stood before the mirror. Overcome with horror, I covered my face with my hands. What I had seen in the mirror was the likeness, no, the exact image, of the old odds and ends man. My hair and beard were completely white, like those of a man who has come out alive from a room in which he has been shut up along with a cobra. My eyes were without lashes, a clump of white hairs sprouted from my chest, and a new spirit had taken possession of my body. My mind and my senses were operating in a completely different way from before. A demon had awoken to life within me, and I was unable to escape from him. Still holding my hands before my face, I involuntarily burst into laughter. It was a more violent laugh than the previous one had been, and it made me shudder from head to foot. It was a laugh so deep that it was impossible to guess from what remote recess of the body it proceeded, a hollow laugh which came from somewhere deep down in my body, and merely echoed in my throat. I had become the old odds and ends man. This was brought to you by The Storyteller on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Anchor. Breaker. Overcast. Pocket Casts. Radio Public. Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the video description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.